Hi, everyone. So hope you had a refreshing lunch break. Uh, now we have Julian with us, who is going to talk about building a clean, maintainable, and tested code base. He's a software engineer at Haycar. Uh, where, are you, uh, where are you streaming from, Julian? I'm streaming from Malta, so a bit far off. <laughs> All right. Cool. Over to you. OK. So um, welcome. I hope you're having a nice day so far. Um, yeah, let's do this. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Julian. For those who do know me, I'm still Julian as well. Um, I'm a senior software engineer at Haycar. And yeah, let's kick this off. So the agenda for this talk is around clean code mainly, um, where we'll see some examples and comparisons starting off with the imports, which usually are at the top of the module. And then we'll go into a function, some logic, and then we'll take that logic and try to decouple it. Um, let me go full screen for you guys so you can see a bit better. Um, then we'll go into a bit of an example for a project structure the same structure as the clean code examples where we'll see a comparison and we'll go through it a bit then we'll have a very short amount of time to go into testing where we'll talk a bit about doc test by test mocking and test package structure which is a bit like the project structure where we we'll see a comparison and we'll discuss that a bit so yeah before we jump into the first few slides where we'll talk about clean code it's important to firstly understand some characteristics in regards to clean code and those are readable and easy to understand reusable and dry by dry we mean do not repeat yourself and that usually means you don't have duplications in your code so what are the benefits of having dry code is that imagine you have five or six duplications of the same piece of code. If you have to change something, you have to change it five or six times in your code base rather than just changing it once in a function that's reusable. Then, of course, it should be documented. That can be doc strings or type hinting, which we'll see a bit of the next few slides, and also third party documentation if you have time for that. Um, and it should be simple and easy to modify or extend. Those are, in my opinion, and I hope a lot of people's opinions, what makes clean code, or at least a few characteristics that make clean code. So let's get started. Um, so what we're seeing over here is an example, I'm sure you, like me, you saw this a few times in your career where we have these type of imports that are a bit scrambled. And that's me over there, a little bit sad with a, with a cat balloon. Um, so let's start off by addressing a few things that we're seeing over here. So the first thing is having imports on the same line using the import keyword is not something recommended by Pep8. Uh, Pep8 is the style guide, Python style guide, the official one. Um, so it's recommended that these are separate on different lines when you're using the import keyword. You can use multiple imports on the same line if you're using the from keyword, which we see underneath although we don't have multiple ones on the same line. And then we have another bit of an issue where we have the standard library import that is a bit off um, further down in the imports. And we also have the collections import, which is a standard library as well, even though it's using the from keyword. So before I continue explaining over here, it's important to understand the recommended import grouping, the, the order um, that is recommended at least by Pep8. 
and that is that you should have descended library imports at the top, which are sys, abc, mat, and many others that are built in. Then you would have the related third party imports and the application library imports. So the related third party imports in this case is what's highlighted, the Django imports. And we also have the requests imports over here. And a few other things that one should keep a bit or should be a bit cautious about when using imports is that avoid using wildcard imports uh, because they are quite unclear in regards to what you're importing and it tends to confuse the automated tools besides the engineer of course looking at it um, but yeah and another note is absolute imports are recommended um, when when you're using either absolute or relative imports you should if if that's sort of something that you can do you should go for absolute imports so yeah i'm quite happy over here um, we have imports that are properly structured clean and readable so we can start off by noting that the standard library imports are at the top and you have separation between using the front keyword and the import keyword and also they happen to be in alphabetical order <laughs> so if you want to be a bit if you want to go all out ocd you can do that as well you can go alphabetical order um, and yeah then we have the django imports so the related third party imports and we can see over here i've added a bit of a segregation between django.db imports and django.conf imports and this is something i'm not sure if everyone does but it would be nice if everyone does <laughs> but i i find imports more readable when you sort of not just segregate them based on the library but also if you're importing over here of course we only have a few imports but if you have a ton of imports having this type of segregation helps a lot in terms of finding what you want to work with and finally we have request import which is a third party import as well over here we don't have um, an example of an application import but that would be in the same structure over here but below below these imports so jumping into the next the next bit of a problem um, <laughs> over here over here we have a simple function um, which is which can be improved quite a bit um, we can see that the function name might not be as descriptive as it can be we have the items argument as well um, and we have the for loop it's using itm um, of course over here it's not confusing because the function is quite quite slim but if you had a function that is about 50 lines 60 lines and you're at the very bottom of it you're going to be like yeah i have no idea what itm is so yeah we can also see some issues with variable naming in terms of not just the argument and the loop but also we can see client over here whichever client that is we don't know um, execution and some duplication down here as well in terms of the exception handling of course it's missing um, doc strings and type hinting which we'll be looking at in the next few slides so what we've done over here is we've changed the namings a bit right starting off with the function name the argument name and with just that we know that we're going to update tasks we don't know what type of tasks yet but we'll see further on 
And we know that on line 19, we can see that it's a step functions client. So that pretty much indicates that we're using Boto3 or something similar. And that is it for now. We've changed also the response. So we know we're getting a response probably from an API call. So let's jump on to the next slide. So I'm not sure what people call this, but I call this code grouping. Um, pretty much a lot like the imports grouping. But if you look at line 22, let me get the pointer, give me a second. So if you look over here, this this part of code, which is which is handling the status updating. And if we go back a slide, we can see that this is a blob of code, right? And of course, I couldn't fit a lot of code in here. So over here, it's readable. But if you have a big chunk of code without any segregation, it tends to get quite confusing. So by simply adding that segregation over there, that space between lines of code, you've you've basically told the engineer that even though these work together, over here I'm doing something and over here I'm doing something different. Um, and it increases readability drastically. Yeah. Then we've added type hinting. We can see that in the argument over here, in the function argument, we know that this is going to be a list of tasks, which are, I couldn't fit all the code over here, but these are Django models, in this case, Django objects. And we've also added the dict over here, which gives us a lot to work with, because at least we know what we're getting, whereas before we weren't even sure if this was a generator or anything else. So that's that's a step forward in order for the next person after us to pick this up. And then we have doc strings. So doc strings are mainly the part over here. And you can see that usually you add a bit of a description in regards to what's happening in the function and you document the parameters. There are a few types, um, a few a few different formats to writing doc strings. I'm using restructured text over here, uh, but there are other types that you can you can adopt. So that's really up to your preference. There's Google and others. Um, but basically, we, we're documenting a bit of the function in order to give a bit more of a context to someone picking this up. And also, I've sneaked in the grouping of the exceptions down here where we have the execution does not exist and the invalid ARN together now, rather than having them, as we've seen before, in two separate accepts. Since they're doing the same thing, it makes sense to have them together. If they're doing two different things, you might want them to have different contexts. So this part we've done as well. Jumping to the next one. So if we go back a slide, we can notice over here on line 33, we're doing a call, right? We're handling the call to the step functions, in this case on AWS, to get the information on the task. And then we also have the try block, which is around quite a bit of code, but in this case, it's quite safe because we're just handling that exception, as well as updating the tasks. So this function is doing two things. 
at the moment. So it might be something we want to look at, possibly making that reusable so we don't have duplication of code going forward. And over here, what we've done is we've taken out the try accept block and the API call, and we've created a separate function. Now, of course, we've added some type hinting over here and some documentation in order to make it a bit more clean and readable for someone else to pick up. In the next, in the next slide, we're going to change the main function. So over here, this is what we've had originally. We had two things coupled together, um, two concerns, and we've improved it to take out the describe execution into its own function. So this is what we end up with. We can see that it's slimmer, cleaner, more more direct in what it's doing and some some things that you might notice about this sample code uh, that we'll we'll discuss in the next slide is that we're explicitly checking for the status and the execution information which is usually called look before you leap um, and there's another method of doing it, which we'll discuss in the next slide. But that is that is the final clean version of our function. And there are a few things that you need to keep in mind about this demo code that we did not address, such as chunking the tasks in order to not eat up all the memory and all of that and possibly even having bulk update rather than saving each task as you're looping over the items. So, as we've just mentioned in the previous slide, we have look before you leap, and then we have easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. The differences are that in one, we're checking if the key is in the dict already before we actually use it. While that might be okay, and it is okay, it, it does convey to the user that that is the exception, not, not the usual behavior of the code, rather than having something that actually conveys that not having the key is the exception. So there's a bit of a different mindset. Both are just fine. Um, I use both. Um, and although, although they are both fine to use, in some cases, the one on the right might be better suited for you. So it's just being aware of, of the different ways of handling it. Okay, so let me let me take a sip before I dry myself <laughs> into a dried fruit. Um, before jumping into project structure, um, in the next slide, we're going to have an example of of a project structure in, in Django, and basically, the idea behind this is quite subjective in a way that not everyone prefers the same thing. Although what we can note over here is that we have a few modules, right? Less modules, probably more code in the modules. Um, in some cases that might be okay, although it doesn't really set you up for the future especially if it's a project that grows, hopefully it does grow or else it would fail. Um, if, if it's a project that's growing drastically and quite fast, then this might, might cause a bit of issues down the line because 
having two models in the models in the models module is okay but as it grows into 10 20 mod models it it starts to raise a bit of an issue on the right hand side we have more packages and modules but less code in each model module sorry um, this might be something that you want to adopt if it's a project that you know will grow if it's something simple like a microservice it might not be something that you require so i'm happy about that also um, looking looking at the example on the right usually uh, in django at least this works out of the box although although you need to import the modules in the init module and that's okay although if you have like checks on the code if an import is used or other checks you might want to use the all done there to define um, the imports and the imports that can be imported from the init although this shouldn't promote using wildcard imports so that's an important important thing to keep in mind and also another note on the example on the right is you might come across a few issues in terms of circular dependency and although django does allow you to use strings in order to link to other models and some other projects you might not and you might need to opt for something like a registry or something similar so something to keep in mind over there okay so the next few slides we're going to look at doc test a very short introduction a simple unit test and a bit of pi test a simple mock and test package structure pretty much the same as we've seen in the previous slide so yeah so let me highlight it over there so doc test this this is the usual syntax of using doc tests doc tests are simply put tests inside your documentation in your doc string or you can even use an interactive text file which which doc tests does support you can read more on python website if you're interested and basically what we're seeing over here is the input so we have three arrows and what we want to run and the expected output and we keep on going we can also catch exceptions and pretty much this does not in no way replace unit tests or pi tests or any of that even though some projects did manage to do that it's very painful um, especially when you have mocks or other things so this should in my opinion should be used as something that brings so much value to your documentation someone that an engineer that looks at this can immediately understand what's happening over here even though the code is quite clean and it's quite self-explanatory having that example over there um, it's it's more explicit in terms of the behavior and another benefit of this that at least i find quite quite beneficial is 
that if you're running, if you're if you're changing this function, this particular function that does have doc tests, you can simply run the tests over here without even moving your hand. You know. Um, yeah, that is all I believe. Yeah. So, in terms of unit tests, this is quite a simple example where we're trying to test the previous function that we've seen. So we we want to test that if we give it a list of a certain numbers, the ratio is correct, right? Just to explain this function a bit before we go into the next one, so you understand what this function does is this function just changes a list of numbers into the simplest form in a ratio, right? So over here on line seven, we're specifying the, actually let's start from the other way around because it might be easier to understand. So we have a simple test case down here with two arguments, right? And then we decorated that test case with PyTest parameterized. And we're saying that we expect the two arguments to be injected into this um, test case. So the first argument of the parameterize are what you're expecting into your function. The second argument is the test data. In this case, I call it test data, but it's usually a list of tuples and or a list of values. It depends if you have one argument or more arguments than one. But in our case, we have two arguments. So we have a list of tuples. The first argument links to the numbers and the second argument links to the expected output. Now, this is beneficial because we don't have to do a loop. What happens over here is PyTest knows that we want to run this test case with different data. So it does that for us rather than having a loop inside the test case or even having multiple test cases. It's much easier to do it this way. And then what we're doing is simply asserting Whereas if you're familiar with unit test, what we do in unit test usually is we use the assert equal. Among others, I would guess the assert equal is the most common, at least, that I've seen. Um, what we use in PyTest is the assert, um, which, in my opinion, comes a bit more naturally. And what we're doing over here, we're, do we're calling the get ratio simplest form function with that we've seen in the previous slide with the input. So these are all linked, numbers, numbers, and numbers. And that links to this, then that one on the second iteration, then that one, and then that one. And then we're expecting that to match the expected output, which in this case would be this ratio, and then none, because we have zeros, one, and two, one, four. Also, if you want to run combinations, you can you can stack the decorators using parameterize, which would then do combinations. Okay, I think we've covered most of the things here. Another important note for someone that is not very familiar with unit tests is that a unit test should test one unit, one single unit of functionality. It shouldn't test multiple things at the same time um, because that that loses a bit of scope and adds to the flakiness of the test cases that you have. So with what we've just said in regards to testing one thing at a time, what we have over here is 
mocking, right? So in order to test this simple function, my function in this case, we need to mock the generate key function. And we need to mock it not just because we decided we want to mock it, but we mock things when they are not deterministic. So something that is random. Um, thank you for that, Julian. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's time for our next speaker now. Uh, but the audience would love to connect with you in breakout Octaver room. So see you there.